Hello, thanks for coming everyone. I really appreciate uh, you showing up for our panel on mass incarceration show social justice uh, here today. I obviously want to thank the Milken Institute for having us here. Um, so my name is Mike Romano. I teach at Stanford Law School and I run something called the Three Strikes Project. I want to introduce everybody quickly on the panel and then uh, jump into our subject area. So from some, my far right, uh, Scott Budnick is a former movie producer, I suppose and uh, the head of an organization called the Anti-Recidivism Coalition. Uh, next to Scott is the Reverend Jesse Jackson, whom I'm sure you all know, former presidential candidate. Uh, next to me is District Attorney Jackie Lacey from Los Angeles County. To her left is Van Jones, who is a host on Crossfire and also former advisor to President Obama. And to his left is Prophet Walker, who is a candidate for uh, State Assembly in California. Uh, so the idea of this panel is that we are going to have a conversation about the problem of mass incarceration and at the same time try to think about innovative solutions um, that we all are working on in different areas and different perspectives. So um, some folks have considered mass incarceration to be the civil rights issue of our time. About two and a half million people in America are behind bars. Uh, the United States has 5% of the world's population and 25% of the prison population. And nowhere is the problem worse than in California. Um, let me get to the first slide. There we go. Um, so this is a slide that shows the incarceration in California um, since 1990, roughly. And this is a slide that tells the story of racial profiling, of the war on drugs, mand mandatory minimum sentencing, stop and frisk, and a lot of the other policies that we've heard about in the news. Um, in 2011, the United States Supreme Court held that California prisons were unconstitutionally overcrowded and ordered the state to start releasing people and put a cap on the number of people that could be in California prisons. At the same time, we have a historic drop in crime. And I think that it would be unfair to have this conversation about mass incarceration without recognizing that almost the exact same time period we've had a really dramatic and historic drop in our violent crime rate in California and across the country. And this drop in crime rate is actually benefiting the same folks that we seem to, that we are concerned about who are suffering under the mass incarceration. I'm talking about mainly poor urban people of color in the country. Um, at Stanford, we were proud to be part, a small part of the solution here, to try to address the mass incarceration problem and the incredibly high incarceration rate that we have in California, while at the same time maintaining a very low crime rate. In 2012, we partnered actually with the District Attorney's Office of Los Angeles County to write a, a ballot measure that would amend California's infamous three-strike sentencing law to make sure that we were no longer sentencing people to life in prison for nonviolent crimes like stealing a pair of socks or baby shoes. Literally, those are not uh, exaggerations. Those are real crime. Those are real uh, examples. Um, so. We started off, we, the first person that we worked with was the Los Angeles di District Attorney to try to craft legislation that would both address what we thought were unfair and disproportionate sentences, while at the same time keeping our crime rate very low. Because you can't solve the, you can't, I don't think, have an honest conversation about mass incarceration without also having a conversation about the crime rate. So I want to start the conversation with the DA uh, from Los Angeles County, Jackie Lacey. I have said that I think that she's the most powerful person in criminal justice in America. There are just as many court uh, houses and courtrooms in Los Angeles County than there is in the entire federal system, just to give you a size of the perspective. And it's really her job to both address both ends of these charts. And I want to ask you, Jackie, to start things off is, what are you doing in your office that you think is most innovative that addresses both the high incarceration rate, but also the historically low crime rate? Uh, I think with the mass incarceration rate, what we've discovered is that jail beds are now expensive commodities and uh, we can no longer use them for uh, those who commit nonviolent, non serious crimes at the rate that we did uh, that led to mass incarceration. So, what we're looking for is some alternatives to car incarceration. Many of the people that are incarcerated are drug addicted and suffering from mental illness. And what we've decided is there are better ways to address that issue through alternatives in the community and residential treatment beds, which have shown to be more cost effective 
and the recidivism rate, which is really where the discussion needs to lie, the recidivism rates drops to around 20%. So in the LA County DA's office, we've made it a priority now to take a look at those uh, programs, implement them, look at some that are going on around the county and see if we can do a better job, particularly with those who are mentally ill. Now, uh, I think a lot of us at this table, we spend uh, our days, we wake up and we see the blue curve. And we think about, and we work on the blue curve, and that's all we think about and all we see. And I wonder, do you, I, and, I, and I'm guessing that you spend most of your time looking at the orange curve to keep the crime rate ground. Do you think it's part of your job to also think about the blue curve, or is really your job to keep Los Angeles safe? Uh, well, I think I have multiple jobs. I, I look at, uh, obviously I pay attention to the crime rates because no one wants a di to have a district attorney where they don't feel safe and safety is very important in every community. Uh, I also look at the incarceration rate, but I look at the cost uh, also because that's very important too. Mm -hmm. And so we're constantly fine tuning and looking for that sweet spot in terms of justice. That with which we can get people's attention so that they don't go out and commit crimes over and over again and yet they're restored and we don't see them again and uh, it doesn't cost the taxpayers as much money and take away from important things like education which is a crime prevention tool. So it's several different things that we look at but obviously public safety has to be number one for me. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, Prophet, I want to ask you about your perspective on the criminal justice system, how you got to sitting at this table and your trajectory really from being in the Watts Housing District all the way up to being a candidate for state senate or state assembly. Excuse right. Me. So my, my getting here is a lot different than most. Um, at the age of six, my mother abandoned me in the Nickerson Garden Housing Projects, one of the poorest and, and worst housing projects in uh, the United States. And from there, at 16, I got into a fight that also resulted into robbery. And I was sentenced at 16 to six years in state prison. And <clears throat> while I was there, one of the things that was very clear to me was that while myself and also my peers, um, we didn't have a solid education, and that was a, a, an issue, and that was an issue that would keep us um, away from succeeding. And so I made it a personal goal to get an education and came home and uh, went to Loyola, became an engineer, and then built tons of buildings uh, since then. But uh, I think one of, the, one of the most striking things that, that hit me was there were some undercurrents uh, that existed in, this, in both of these curves, and that was just high levels of poverty. And with the high level of poverty, um, denied certain resources to, to a lot of us. And so now I'm running for the assembly to actually to address some of these issues in the, in the, in the state, um, but focus on some of the creative ways that uh, we can decrease the, the blue line and continue down the, 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 the yellow line. And some of them, for instance, in the community of Watts, where um, we see these unique partnerships of folks who are formerly incarcerated, our former gang interventionists um, partnering with LAPD and law enforcement to actually bring transformative change to the area. And I think this panel represents that as well. So, Prophet, I think a lot of us feel that the justice system treats uh, young, uh, especially black men of color, unfairly. I think that that is uh, you know, a broad statement that maybe we could all agree with. I was just curious, in your individual case, do you feel like you were treated unfairly? Do you think you got punished too harshly? Can you talk about a little bit about how you went through the system and went into prison as such a young person? Right. I, so I've, I've actually thrown this around in my head a lot. Without a doubt, I've accepted responsibility for what I've done and believe, in fact, I should have um, paid some price to society. The, the extent of that price is where we question, and that's where I think the harshness um, of the sentencing exists. Um, but again, I think when we talk about poverty, when we talk about high incarceration rates, it always ends up with us focusing on uh, a certain amount of minority groups, either black or brown minority groups, where without a doubt we're disproportionately affected by the justice system. And I think when, um, when we're passing legislation, uh, it's naive of us to say that these, uh, these factors of race and, and socioeconomic status 
doesn't exist when we pass our legislation. And so without a doubt to, to systematically affect um, our incarceration rates and specifically for black and brown, uh, we have to think in those terms, absolutely. So, uh, Prophet, part of your story is actually meeting uh, Scott Budnick in prison. And for those of you who don't know, Scott uh, was a producer of the Hangover series of movies. And uh, I want to... <laughs> uh, Scott, uh, you know, you come at this from a completely uh, unique perspective, I think, and a lot of people admire you for it. Can you tell the story of how you came from being a movie producer to volunteering in the jails and prison, meeting people like Profit, and then running the Anti-Recidivism Coalition, some of the in initiatives that you're involved with? It's a long question. Um, I was uh, getting ready to, I think we just finished old school, and we were doing Starsky and Hutch, and a friend of mine asked me to uh, come down to the local juvenile hall where he was teaching a creative, creative writing class. And I sat down with, uh, I went there that day, first time ever in a, a prison or juvenile institution, sat down with 10 kids facing life in prison at 14, 15, 16 years old. And um, as I went around the table and heard their stories, and Prophet was, when, was in one of my first classes uh, when he was 16 years old, um, I heard stories of in incredible victimization that led up to the choice of them becoming a victimizer. And I didn't quite understand why our hearts break for them when they're sexually and physically abused, our hearts break for them when they don't have parents and are in foster care. But the day they commit a crime, they're put into prison, given really uh, poor counsel, and uh, uh, are, go are going through a system that just eats them alive. And then they go into a prison system that eats them alive even more. So uh, as Profit journeyed through the system, we were able to start a, a college program together. Um, we're now 6,000 inmates in the California prison system are full-time college students. And now we've created a pathway from prison into community colleges and universities that I'm going to be talking to the DA about partnering with us on. Um, and we also started a classification program because when Profit was there, the prison system would take a young offender, overclassify them, and send them to prisons with incredibly violent inmates and absolutely no education or programs because the system was overcrowded and they just needed to find a bed. Now we've created a system that was actually Profit's brainchild where every single person right now in LA County that's 18 years old and goes to prison for their first time, we gear them immediately to a high school program, a college program, or a vocational program that's gonna give them a skill and a degree to use the second they walk out. And through our nonprofit ARC, we're now really focused on housing number one. So when these young people come out of incarceration, they're not sent back to war zone communities, dysfunctional households, and having to do college and then come back to that. We're creating college dorms for the formerly incarcerated so they're around positive peers who are all moving in the same direction. We're also um, looking at a really innovative, the first social impact bond pay for success program in California around recidivism where we're engaging private funders to build a college campus behind bars so changing what prison is for young people, we we're building a college campus with a fence around it. Nothing will look like a prison except for the fence. And in that, we're gonna deliver the best high school programs, the best college programs, because we're not gonna be able to keep everyone out of prison. So let's take the folks we have in there, let's create exceptional programs, substance abuse, mental health, and then the day they walk out, let's create that pipeline directly into colleges and universities and surround them with all the mentors and help that we can get. So we're now working on that. The California Endowment, Dr. Bob Ross, Daniel Zingali, Barbara Raymond, they're our funders for that project. And that could be up to a $100 million project. Right now, in the, in the juvenile system, it costs $200,000 a year to incarcerate one kid. $200,000 a year with a 74% recidivism rate. So we're spending $200,000 a year to fail seven of 10 times. Private business understands that if we bring a lot of nonprofits together that really care about these kids and see their assets, not their deficits, that we'll be able to turn those re, uh, recidivism rates upside down. So that's what we're working on right now. I, that's really exciting. I mean, Scott, you're a real inspiration, I think, especially people from the pri private, section, private sector to start thinking about uh, things the way that they can go into prison and help these folks. And I think it really did start we just volunteering and seeing these people as you know, individuals that you could relate to in a way that they're, you know, they're, they're literally walled off from society and um, you know, your compassion yeah. and your energy is uh, you know, unbelievable. Thank you, but I, I also think, and one more point I wanna make is that this takes everybody being at the table and 
We passed a bill last year that dealt with juvenile parole, and we had nine Republicans vote for it. We had a DA supporting, law enforcement supporting. Um, so different people from different sectors who you didn't think could align on something are aligning. And even in this classification bill, the program I told you about directing young people towards colleges and universities, um, right now we're putting it into legislation. It's currently sitting in, the, in, in Sacramento right now in the form of a bill. And this was something I had been discussing with one of uh, Jackie Lacey's deputies, uh, and he actually helped me formulate it and was incredibly supportive. So you find friends and allies from the places where most people aren't looking. And I think when we, when we, we talked, we had a great meeting and we found intersections yeah. where we could work together to, to help the youth that are in the system. So it's been very successful so far. So Van, you spend every day with Newt Gingrich, <laughs> or almost, or a lot of time with Newt Gingrich. Sure do. Uh, and he is surprisingly, or at least I think surprising for a lot of folks, progressive or to the left on a lot of these issues. He's leading the way. Grover Norquist is, you know, very progressive, I think, on some of these issues. Rand Paul. Can you talk about this sort of unlikely left-right coalition and why are we relying on uh, those folks to be talking so forcefully about mass incarceration? <coughs> Uh, well, first of all, it's, it's an honor to be here. Um, I knew Scott, if you think that Scott it, it just got this passionate last week, I knew Scott before anybody knew Scott. Uh, he was running around in juvenile halls with a video camera and Carol Biondi 15 years ago. Nobody knew his name, and he was just that passionate before Hangover. So I want to re respect and acknowledge that. Thank you. Um, you know, just ser serious guy. Thank you. Um, I, I also uh, want to say how proud I am to be on, on the, the panel with Reverend Jackson. You said he's a former presidential candidate. That was 20 plus years ago. He's a present day civil rights hero and leader. I want to make sure he gets a round of applause for, for his incredible work. Um, and then uh, uh, this guy here, uh, when you said that you were formerly incarcerated, there's some jaws that literally drop uh, because you, you're so pretty and you're so smart and well-spoken. Well don't do that to his ego. Oh, That's not pretty. I don't know. But uh, uh, it, it's um, but that's part of the problem. There are thousands and hundreds of thousands of young men just, and young women just as impressive who are, uh, whose, genius is being, whose genius is being wasted. And that's how I got involved. I'll talk about Newton in a second. But I had the opportunity and the privilege, uh, thanks to the fight that Reverend Jackson and others led for civil rights, to go to Yale Law School. And I was raised in the Christian church. I was super nerd, never got in any trouble, honestly never did. But when I got to Yale Law School and I got to Yale's campus, I was shocked to find 90% of the campus nonviolent drug offenders. That's what they are. They're young people. They're making mistakes. They're experimenting with drugs, so-called. They don't go to prison. They go to rehab, and they go on with their lives. Four blocks away, in the housing projects, Young people who make the same mistakes wind up going to prison. So I've been very clear. Uh, I'm anti-drug, but I'm also anti-drug war because it's, it's the way that it's put together is unfair, number one. Number two, this is an incredibly important moment. Shockingly enough, we have a bipartisan consensus that what we're doing right now with prisons is stupid, it's too expensive, it's wasteful, it creates less safety, and it doesn't make any sense. And I am proud to say that Newt Gingrich and others have been uh, loud and forceful on this. I think something's happening in the Republican Party we should talk about. I think there's some ideas we could talk about that could bring us uh, 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 together. First of all, you have the red state governors who have to make a decision. Do they want to keep raising taxes to pay for these prisons or do they want to close prisons? They, and they have to make a decision. Are they either, what do they hate more? Do they, do they want to see us continue going this way or they want to reduce taxes. In order to reduce taxes, they've got to get smarter on prisons. And even Rick Perry, uh, governor of Texas, is actually moving now in our direction on prisons. So you have red state governors have a financial conservative interest in getting this done right. You have the libertarians, who, like Rand Paul, who are concerned with excessive government power. Excessive government power to punish people. Some of them may be concerned that with the changing demographics in America, maybe that power may be used against some of them. That may be an issue. But regardless, they don't like the way we're going, and they, are, they have turned on the drug war. And lastly, you do have actual religious conservatives that believe in second chances and redemption. So you have now three parts of the Republican Party 
that I think are ready to move and can be moved. We have to take that very seriously. Last point. This particular issue has been handled so badly, it is so stupid, we're wasting so much money, we're having such horrible outcomes, that we can actually make conservative arguments. You don't have to be a liberal. You said, well, is somebody moving to the left on this issue. You don't have to be a liberal anymore to think this is stupid. Uh, whatever happened to aligning financial incentives? Whatever happened to competition? Whatever happened to looking at big, bloated government bureaucracies and saying big, bloated government bureaucracies should be better run? If you believe in aligning financial incentives, if you believe in competition, if you're against big, bloated government bureaucracies, you're against the prison system. Why? Number one, where is the alignment of financial incentives? If I am a warden and I have 100 people, if I kill myself and come up with great programming and do all the stuff you're telling me to do, and a hundred of those guys don't come back. I've saved the state something like a gazillion dollars. Do I get a bonus? Do I get one penny? Do I get any piece of that action? No, I don't. Why can't you have programs where the warden actually says, look, this guy leaves, he or she, they stay gone for three years, you just saved us umpty ump dollars, you get 20% of that. Now the warden actually has a financial stake in every single person, and they're going to do whatever they can. They'll be building the colleges. Number one, align the financial incentives. Pay for performance. Number two, why is it that we don't have real competition? The incarcerators have a monopoly with a bad product. Let this guy compete for those dollars. Let him compete for those dollars. Let a grandma compete for those dollars. You give one grandma in Watts, one kid, and two hundred thousand dollars that kid is never getting in trouble again i promise grandma will say son let's go to talk about this in europe <laughs> i'll drive you there in a prius and we'll still have 150k to spend I just stay out of trouble for a year and I'll give you $100,000. I mean, you can't come up with a dumber way to waste $200,000. Anybody could outcompete these guys. Where's the competition? And then the last thing I'll say is simply this. Big, I, I don't want to hear a single conservative talk to me about big, dumb, failed government bureaucracies that succeed by failing and then talk about the welfare system. No. This prison system. The worse they do, the more money they get. The more people that leave and come back with their friends, the bigger they get. And I believe that with the leadership that we have with district attorneys like this, who care about real people, real communities, with her record, with her leadership, we can finally get to a place where we have a de-incarceration industry. People make money getting people out of prison rather than an incarceration industry. Thank you. So Reverend Jackson, I uh, started off this panel talking about um, how mass incarceration is seen as a civil rights era of our time and I'm sure you're familiar with Michelle Allen Alexander's book, uh, The New Jim Crow. I was wondering if you felt that those types of claims were overblown or if they resonated with you and if you could tell a little bit about your experience with the civil rights movement and now with the mass incarceration movement. Well, let me express my thanks to you and my fellow panelists. How many of you here have a relative in jail? Raise your hand. You have a relative in jail. You know someone who has tried drugs, raise your hand. That's a telling story. You know folks on drugs tried not in jail, which is suggestive of the way it falls out. Secondly, um, in the South now, what's being used is locking people up, one, to take them off the voting rolls, and to make a profit at the same time. Mm. Um, there are now two and a half million Americans in prison. About 55% are African American. In the deep south states, you have a combination of, of stop and frisk. Uh, two companies make a billion and a half dollars a year off a, pre, off a prison telephone calls, collect phone calls back home and you have prison labor making clothes for Target and Walmart and the big box stores 
uh, and, and retrofitting military outfits, a real serious labor market. And often they get out of prison, they cannot get those same jobs because they have been to prison. Uh, the way Michelle's book fits into me is that this is an extension of slavery. Uh, and slavery all were free except those who are in prison. When it was over, for the most part, those who were locked up for vagrants were locked up to do, to do labor. Uh, when I grew up, I used to watch in front of our house neighbors who didn't have a job, kicking up the street between Friday night and Sunday morning, taken to the stockade. Uh, and then if their boss, quote unquote, did not come and get them out on Sunday afternoon, they'd be in front of our house the next week in front of their children, cleaning out gutters and cutting grass and doing city works. This was a form of, of peonage. Uh, the next point is that poverty is a weapon of mass destruction. Poverty destroys the body, spirit, and crushes dreams. You will not expect a fish to swim out of water. So to be in capitalism without capital and skills is asking a fish to swim without water and to dive in the pool at the same time. It simply does, does not work. Uh, those in prison have the least amount of legal support. Uh, six million Americans have now lost their right to vote because they've been in the prison process. This is extremely political stuff here. In many places down south today, an active sheriff has, owns a jail, a county jail. And so the jail becomes a jail hotel or a homeless shelter, a shelter for mentally ill people. I close on this note in Chicago, Cook County Jail has 10,000 inmates. According to the sheriff, about 40% of those there are on heavy dosages of medicine every day because they are sick and should not be there. A significant number are there on non-violent drug charges, first or second time use, who if they leave, they have no place to go. Uh, a couple of years ago, a few years ago, when Jennifer Hudson's mother was killed and brother, we're having prayer in front of the house at night, a cold Chicago night. And while praying, I heard footsteps coming and some little groups that come with their little caps. I knew they were little gangbangers. And the, the leader stepped up and said, Reverend, and he looked at me and began to cry. I, I, want, I want to eat and I want a job. And as he cried, the bigger one stepped up and said, look, dude, we just got out of the joint. We need to work someplace. And, and I, I embraced them because they were really non-threatening to me. I embraced them. And then I thought, I looked down the street to the school. If they go to school, they get five meals a week. We cook in the jail, they get 21 meals a week. It's warm in the wintertime. They're not homeless. There are 18,000 Chicago kids who go to school who are homeless. They don't have a residence. For them, jail is a homeless shelter and a daycare center. Also, the prosecutors overcharge all too often. And lastly, the, the, kind, of soft, the, the kind of soft on the bill of racism is that if it's, when these killings take place, and someone says, it's black and white. Now, why is that question? Because it will be handled differently. You know that if it's black on white, it's jail time. If it's white on black, it's re rebel time. Black on black is military time. There's a, there's the fact that the killings in Chicago now are basically black on black is objectified and categorized. That means it's non-political. You have a situation where you have 40% unemployment, guns in that we don't manufacture and not sell, drugs in, jobs out. We've lost 90,000 jobs to NAFTA in the last 10 years. Jobs, in, jobs out, drugs and guns in, which, and targeted for home foreclosure, which drove down the tax base. So you have little education, more access to jail than the college. In our case, it's 50,000 a year to stay in Cook County Jail. Some have been there six months to seven years, six months to six years in pretrial detention, waiting for trial up to six years. 
only to come to court and have less time than they spend in jail. Pre-trial detention is a big and prison labor. Thank you very much. So thank you, Reverend Jackson. But, uh, I do want to toss it over to the, to the district attorney here because I was not exaggerating when I said that I really do think that she is the most important person in criminal justice in America. Her office prosecutes 300,000 cases a year. Let me say it again. 300,000 cases a year is in, in her office. When we're talking about uh, crime in the inner city and poverty and gangs, this is her office. It's the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office that's handling it. And I just want to hear your reaction. If you hear us talk about it, it's, you know, uh, you and Rudy Giuliani are locking up all the black teenagers in America. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about the reality of what your office deals with and what you deal with and what is on your desk right now? Yes. Uh, well, I want to go back 30 years when I first started uh, being a prosecutor. You can imagine being in the courtroom, being the prosecutor, and uh, most of your colleagues are not African American but the defendants are African-American. One of the things that um, uh, I learned is that many of the victims are poor, they're black and brown. And many times, one of the stories that isn't told is that these people who are living in the community who are law-abiding want help, they want safety, they want to be able to enjoy the same quality of life that people in this setting, in this neighborhood enjoy. And so there needs to be balance and accountability. And while I believe that you consider things such as mental illness, that you consider youth, that you consider that someone can make a mistake, that you consider drug addiction, make no mistake about it. There are people, as my mother would say, and she's from the South, that just have to go because they are violent, because they are uh, they don't respect other people's rights because they have embraced a culture of senseless violence. And, and what prosecutors are now, the modern prosecutor is now saying is, you have to look at this from a multi-faceted uh, approach. It's not a good idea to just open up the jails and say there's no accountability, let everybody out. Because there are certain people who, even on drugs, will need a little bit of time in a custody setting in order to get their mind right, in order to get off of drugs. But I think the modern prosecutor also realizes that when you're talking about nonviolent people, when you're talking about people who are mentally ill, and mental illness is real, that jails should not and have been overused in those instances. But we still do have to have a place to keep our kids, to keep our grandmas, to keep everybody safe. Have Van, Van, Van talks about the $200,000. My mother didn't need $200,000 to keep us safe. And I have a feeling Van had that same kind of upbringing. And so we've she got to it, continue. Though. Yeah, She could use it, though. Yeah, she could. Well, my mother could have, too. <laughs> yeah. but, but I want to make sure that when we have this discussion, Michael, that it's balanced. I, I think you're right. I, I was just about to ask, does mandatory sentencing uh, hamper judge's ability to make judgment like you get be, as in being discerned for some people over the over the bar some people are not so a absolutely mandatory sentencing has tied the hands of judges but remember uh, Reverend Jackson the mandatory a lot of these mandatory sentencing laws were a reaction by voters to a case normally attached to a girl's name a child's name that's how a lot of this stuff happened. They were attached to fear, and maybe they do need to be looked at again and revised. But it's the voters, at least in California, and that's all I can talk to. No, the reason I was raising the question is like three strikes is that's all the matter. You have some of the most absurd cases, right? As opposed to exercising judgment, who, who in the judge's discretion should be in the development program on the incarceration program? That's what I'm trying to say. Yes. No, I agree with. With LA County, we were one of the first people that broke ranks with imposing uh, three strikes on every single person that came in through. It was called, uh, if you spit on the sidewalk, you go away uh, for life. And so we were the first region that said, we're not going to do that. Uh, but it has been an effective tool for some people where we can't get their attention. But, but I'd like I to ask you. Let's go. Well, first of all, I, 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 everybody is so impressed with you and so, so excited to have you. Uh, doing what you're doing, and it is going to take a multifaceted approach. Um, I would like to get your reaction to some of the ideas 
It seems to me that you have so much money, a dime out of every dollar in the state of California, in terms of our state budget, is going toward incarceration. And it seems to me if we just took that dime and said, okay, what is the smartest thing we could do with that dime, we probably wouldn't come up with the system that we have. So when you hear an idea like Scott saying, hey, we're going we're to uh, have uh, pay for performance bonds and, and try to use that money creatively, do you think that's good? I mean, I just want to hear your reaction to some of this stuff. Some um, creative financial I, stuff. I think on paper that sounds great. Sounds good on paper. <laughs> I think on paper it sounds great, but the reality of it is, I hate to say, and I love my legislature, California legislature, but it's harder to get done than you can imagine. Mm. And there are some unintended consequences of paying people who operate prisons. I, I particularly don't uh, necessarily like private prisons where certain people are able to pay to live in cushier environments as opposed to, say, when profit. Uh, who didn't have money has to go to, to a county prison. There's a way to incentivize it. I, I just have never found that what works in private industry necessarily works in government. Government is nuanced. Uh, and so that's, that's really my, yeah, my that, reaction. The idea of doing the social impact bond, it actually takes it completely out of the private prison uh, connotation. It's actually going to be the first, there's other states that have done it, be the first nonprofit prison to be that where a nonprofit is running a juvenile facility, but by doing a pay for success model, unlike a private prison where they're trying to lower the costs and lower the money they spend on rehabilitation so they can make a profit, under pay for success, you gotta do as much as you can because you're only getting paid at the end of a, a study period if much less people are coming back into custody. So you're looking, we basically have a six year study where there's a control group who are not coming to the academy and then there's a group that is coming to the academy and you follow them for three years in and three years out and you look at the ones who came to the academy, how many, that, how, how many returned, and the ones who didn't and stayed in adult prison, how many returned. And I believe we'd be able to lower a recidivism rate and from 74%. I believe we could cut that in half. All right, I, I just want to jump in here for a second because um, I, I do think that uh, these economic arguments uh, are important and they have a place. But um, in my experience, actually, the public is further along on this issue than we give them benefit for the doubt for. Agreed. And actually, we don't need to be saying we're going to be saving this much money. When we did Proposition 36, we passed with 70% of the statewide vote. Every county in California passed uh, three strikes reform. And if, according to exit polls, you asked why you voted for this, it was because the three strikes were too long. These were unfair sentences. It wasn't because we're saving money. And I don't think that Newt and Rand Paul and these guys, I think that it, 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 it resonates with their core conservative principles about big government and the people versus, you know, the well, individual Well, also on, on, the, on the bill that we did last year, um, Newt Gingrich and Grover Norquist both not only talked about the fiscal savings, but also talked about the human value that we'll be saving. And that idea of redemption was in everything that they wrote. So they weren't just talking about fiscal talking points. They were talking about the incredible folks like Prophet Walker who can come out and do incredible things to give back to society. Yeah, Prophet. Can I ask, you know, may I, Prophet, uh, because I think the prosecutor is in a very difficult situation. In my, she's dealing with the right nowness of it. We're dealing with the altness of it, and that is this dynamic tension. Uh, jobs, education, transportation to jobs matter. In Chicago, since it's so in the news these days, it's that there are three cities. In the ghetto, and Roseland, and and uh, Inglewood, and Lawndale, and, and uh, 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 Austin, unemployment is forty percent. For youth above fifty percent, they've closed uh, eighty thousand homes have been lost. Uh, they've closed small businesses, uh, foreclosed homes, tax base down, education based upon tax base. They've closed post offices. They've closed fifty schools. They've closed trauma units and hospitals. Uh, it's, it's abandoned. Uh, so that's one Chicago. And in seven of those wars, for most of the killing is taking place because of a low intensity drug gun war taking place. Drugs as uh, the economy and guns to reinforce it. The north side, where the press covers for the most part, unemployment is 4%. In the suburbs, Chicago land is jobs wanted signs. So you have one Chicago in Chicago land suburbs. You have a Chicago 4% of what Northwestern is and DePaul and all of that. You've got this 40% unemployment zone. Now, in that zone, there are no gun shops, nor gun 
uh, 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 practice ranges. We know they make guns in the suburbs in Barrington. We know that. We know they go from there to a place called Chuck's Gun Shop, where according to police, 75% of all guns come from one gun shop. We know that. We know where they're made, where they're sold, then they get transferred over into straw purchase in here. Now why, if you can't stop the flow of guns, so with guns in, drugs in, jobs out, as a simple combination. There's no willingness to invest in targeted jobs and targeted education, targeted health care. So even the absence of jails is not the presence of job education and dreams. Even, even if you close all the jails, unless you have a, and they've taken, even with the charter schools, they've taken away the, uh, the trades component. Yeah. So kids have no functional capacity. They've now got maybe 200 kids on the experiment trying to figure out how to, how to tear down houses that have to be torn down. Then they need the skills to begin to rebuild. So we, they're talking about people without capital, in capitalism, without skills. They can't, they're dysfunctional. All right, so we've been talking a lot about big ideas here, profit. What are you, can you tell us about what you're doing with people in your neighborhoods, bringing them up to camp, working with police officers. Can you just like bring it down to a little bit of grounding us here a little bit? Yeah, I, and I think it goes back to Miss Lacey's point where um, <clears throat> we're combining all these ideas together on a community level. And so one of the things that I saw in, in Watts, there's four major housing projects where everyone rivaled against one another. Uh, in 2006, 2007, we had about an average of two murders a day. It was nuts. And these kids were, were killing one another based on territory and believing, and they were in a three square mile radius of one another, believing that they hated each other. And what we did is instead of uh, feeding into this idea, we were able to get kids from all four of the housing projects, take them outside of their, their uh, setting, take them into a camp, but also say to everyone who, who purports that they are part of the overall solution, elected officials, police officers, community members, parents, teachers, and say, you're all coming to camp with us also. And you're coming to camp in plain clothes, and you're gonna play. And you're, gonna, and you're going to go back to the basic level of, of building a community together. Um, and what we saw from that was children, uh, one, at the end of the weekend crying and saying that they didn't want to leave their new best friend uh, who was from a different housing project. We saw the, the mother and fathers who disbe disbelieve or had um, a lack of faith in the, the overall political and, and law enforcement structure believe again that in fact uh, there could be hope and change. And it, it furthered this idea of community safety partnership. One of the things when we talk about fiscal responsibility um, and the 10% on every dollar that we lend to incarceration and how we can figure out the incarceration system, one of the things that's clear that can solve this is how do we prevent it from ever happening altogether? And a substantial amount of the 10% that we spend should in fact go into preventing these kids who become victimizers, preventing them from ever even becoming victims Probably in the first the, place. Some and of the same people who thought that locking people up was an answer and never thought the war on poverty was the answer. And so right. even the absence of jails is not the presence. Of, Correct. So yep. uh, to, uh, to put it a, a formula, if you have a size 10 foot, mm -hmm and a size eight shoe, no matter what your behavior, does, you got a coin coming, doctor. Right, and that- and Because, that, because <laughs> I mean, it's a structural problem. When I was a little young and- It's his turn, Robert. And, I, and, and <laughs> But it, it goes back to that, again, is, is again, we, we, the way we begin to address these systemic things such as poverty, by and large, it shows we educate people. We educate people, they come back to their community and they're able to help bring it out of the depths of poverty. We're losing so much money in the form of education to the amount of incarceration. So alleviating the amount of prison, alleviating the amount of incarceration, again, lends back to educating our population and bringing us out of poverty. And then also focusing, lastly, a broad idea that I have, and some may agree or not, but I think later will, is focusing in on our pop culture um, and how it adds to this overall deal that we're having. And if, if we 
we talk about the yellow line of crime going down. We had a pop culture um, in the 90s where we were peaked at there of NWA and many of the other rap things that we know of, where it was a sort of harsh time in the pop culture. Um, we now have a pop culture of skinny jeans and skateboarding. Um, and I think has by and large attributed in the, in the minds and psyches of our children uh, that being tough and, and those things aren't cool within the urban communities. But in fact, um, being successful is a, a cooler model. Ben. Let me say, say a couple things. First of all, um, this slide has sort of been sitting there uh, annoying me. <laughs> and um, I just want to point out that uh, everything we say can be undermined just by that slide if we don't deal with it. Uh, it seems like whatever we're saying, the incarceration stuff is working. What I would point out, and I think you're a scholar on this, the crime rate has gone down across the country, even in states that aren't spending as much money as we are and aren't locking up as many people as we are in California. So I just want to point out, something's happening. You may be, be closer to right, but something is happening. That this looks correlated. Or it looks like, like it's, there's a correlation there that may not be a causation there. Crime is going down everywhere, even places where they're not locking people up as stupidly as we are here in California. I just wanted to say that. The other thing I want to say is this. Reverend Jackson was pointing to this lack of jobs. If we don't deal with that, everything else goes away. Nothing stops a bullet like a job. And part of the, the challenge that we have in California is that right here in California, uh, I do a lot of my work in Northern California. You have kids in Oakland who are mathematical geniuses. How do I know they're mathematical geniuses? If you can do at three o'clock in the morning a drug deal right. where you're leaning into somebody's car and you're dealing in metrics, you've never had an algebra class, you don't have a calculator, and you never are off by a penny, you're a mathematical genius, and you're looking both ways for the cops the whole time, and you're never off, you're a mathematical genius. 30 minutes from Oakland, there's a place called Silicon Valley that's based on mathematical genius, where people are making millions of dollars, even the lowest encoders are making $80,000 a year, and we haven't figured out in California how to get that kid from East Oakland, 30 minutes down the road to Silicon Valley, where they can use that mathematical genius to make new products, new services, new apps, new fortunes. So we're sitting here acting as if it's impossible to solve this thing. When obviously we got like said, a dime out of every dollar and the state's already put against it. We have in Hollywood this digital uh, revolution that's happening that's all math and science based and creativity based with mathematical geniuses and creative kids your, your age and younger in every neighborhood. And we got Silicon Valley up the road. So we have this campaign called Yes We Code. Not Yes We Can, we already did that. <laughs> yes We Code, to try to get 100,000 low opportunity young people trained to be the best computer coders in the world. And we've got Facebook as a partner, the Ford Foundation as a partner, the Rockstar Prince as a partner, uh, Chris Tucker who's here as a partner. Give Chris Tucker a big round of applause, by the way. He's right here doing incredible stuff. Um, but it's when we put these two ideas together, we need to close the prison doors and open the doors of opportunity and technology, that's when we're going to start seeing these numbers go in a very different direction. All right. I think, man, let me, I just, I'm going to I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, take my prerogative as moderator here. There's one question in the audience. I do want to try to open it up. We have really time for just a quick question. So why don't you shoot? Certain in front. It's you. Speak loudly. All right, so that's, a, so that's a question about drug decriminalization, legalization. We're working on a new initiative to uh, uh, make uh, drug possession a mandatory misdemeanor rather than felony and with these strike sentences. But I do want to hand this over to the DA for the last word here because I do think that there is this perception here that we are just locking up nonviolent drug dealers. This is the war on drugs. And we've put a lot of challenges to you, right? Uh, and what are your challenges to us in order to try to resolve this uh, problem together. The DA and the police can't solve it mm. by themselves. That's my challenge to you. Uh, a couple of things. One, we have come a tremendously long way in terms of recognizing the difference between a drug user mm. 
an addict versus a predator who is out there making money. And our priority is to go to the predator who is waiting for the addict to be released from, say, a drug program. Our priority is to go after the drug um, dealer who is waiting outside your child's school. We understand what it's like to kick a drug habit. We have, all of us have relatives who have struggled with it, if not our own selves. Mm. So we understand that in getting off of drugs is tough. It's going to take multiple chances, and we support that. We cannot, though, support uh, people who are trying to get our children hooked early and who are out there trying to make it hard for the addict. But what I see as, uh, in terms of crime prevention is it seems like, I think jobs are a great idea, but it's, it goes deeper than that. Mm. A lot of kids have given up hope. And we need to figure out why so many kids don't even see themselves as achieving what this panel has achieved. And that's really something that's deep in the soul. And so we have got to do more, get out of our corporate offices, grab some of these kids, bring them along on your day, have them ride along with you and look them in the eye, engage them and start talking to them about you have options. That, that gang banging, that dr using drugs, that, that that lifestyle is not your only hope. There are people and we have got to be more about uh, reaching out and doing a lot more with regard to prevention. I'm with profit. I want to never see you get into jail. Yeah. I don't want you in the jails. We want our crime rate, we want our workload to go down. Uh, but it, that is going to take a lot of work by a lot of different people. Reverend Jackson, are we, are we going in the right direction? I don't think so. A little bit. The extent to which we focus on what's wrong with us. What's wrong with what us is in? What's wrong with, is it size 10 foot, size 8 shoe? Either cut off your foot or open up the shoe. Mm. Now, if you figure something wrong with the shoe, then, you know, you cut your foot off. <laughs> why are we so, why don't we ride horses? Why don't we have skating rinks? Why don't we ski? Why don't we see the, the open air? Because we're locked in, somebody programmed us in there. I watched the, the NCAA last game, University of Connecticut and uh, Kentucky, and watched these 10 ghetto boys from the same neighborhoods who had been nurtured since they had that little extra pep in their step. 10 boys on the court, on the coaches, rather than in the court, on the judges, because they were programmed for success. They, they were brought out of and lifted up. Nothing was wrong with them, except they need to be coached and loved, nurtured, and given a dream beyond themselves. And so if you look at these overcrowded, and one more time, how many of you have a, a relative in jail? Raise your hand. How many of you know somebody who's tried drugs? Raise your hand. And so long as most folks who try drugs ain't in jail, and most folks who don't try them are in jail for profit, that's a fundamental structure, political issue. It's, it's not just personal, it's political. Thank you. All right, uh, I want to wrap this up here. I really want to thank the Milken Institute. I particularly want to thank Nancy, who helped put this uh, panel together. And, um, and I'm sure we'll be milling about if anybody has questions afterwards. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you.